Hello, security pros, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on today's ESA webinar titled Building a Security Ecosystem that Drives Efficiency, Profitability, and Support. During this webinar, SNAP1 experts will show you how their free Oversee Remote Management platform can manage individual devices or entire networks, simplifying service while decreasing truck rolls providing world-class support and creating recurring monthly revenue are what Oversee does best. At the end of the webinar, they will share an exclusive offer for current SNAP1 partners and integrators who would like to sign up. I'm Hannah Boone, ESA's Marketing and Communications Manager. I'm excited to be leading this webinar here today. Before we dive in, I'd like to just provide some tips for those of you joining on your first ESA webinar. So first of all, welcome. You will be muted for the duration of this session. That doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So if you have a question or comment that ever comes to mind at any point during today's session, make sure to click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and I'll ensure that we save some time for your questions with our experts here today. We will also be recording this webinar so that you can re-watch the on-demand session and share it with your colleagues. So tomorrow, you will receive an email thanking you for your attendance here today, along with a link to the recording. If your company is a member of ESA, we do thank you and hope you're utilizing your benefits to save, expand your team, and get connected to the ESA community. But if you're not yet a member of the Electronic Security Association, we advise that you check us out. We're on esaweb.org, and ESA is the largest and longest standing association serving the pro-installed electronic security and life safety industry. Our members are integrators, dealers, monitoring centers, and even manufacturers and service providers in the space. We at ESA realize that your time is valuable and we really appreciate you spending some of that time with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce some of our experts. First, we have Evan Marty. Evan was previously an integrator and he took his expertise to his current role as product manager of Oversee with Snap1 for over 10 years. We also have Andrew Ward. Andrew has been a vital part of the Access Networks team for five years and is currently serving as the business development manager for the Western region. So without further ado, Andrew, you can uh, take it away from here. My pleasure. Thank you, Anna. Um, so today we're going to, very exciting opening slide here, building a security ecosystem that drives efficiency, profitability, uh, and how to go about supporting that. Um, there's that's a mouthful, and I think the kind of first step to uncovering uh, that would be uh, the network that uh, the systems sit on, and so um, we're going to talk uh, about all things related to building a network that can support uh, a dynamic, uh, growing infrastructure in a uh, small commercial or, uh, you know, advanced uh, residential application. And um, this would include uh, all of the things that um, the attendees uh, on, in this ESA presentation do in their day-to-day -day business as well, as far as sitting on a network. And so um, the first thing we have to do <laughs> is we have to, uh, we have to have what I what I like to call the minimum standard agreement. And um, when a bunch of uh, physicists uh, get together and they have a very much like what we're having right now, um, they all have to agree on the standard model. And what the standard model is in physics is it's the uh, theory that um, basically uh, that everybody has to agree on that the elements uh, that create or support uh, the known universe. So for physicists, they all have to agree on this before anybody can kind of proceed with their argument or uh, theoretical uh, application. So for here, we're going to have what's called the minimum standard agreement on a network. And when I say that, uh, I show you this picture. And what we have pictured here is what we in our industry would refer to as uh, a network. And when I say network, this is what I'm talking about. Now, the reason we have to show this slide is because uh, internet service providers, which are the entire reason uh, why networks have grown in our industry, uh, they have a different concept of what a network is. And um, the internet service providers, and when I say internet service provider, I'm talking about the, you know, uh, Comcast, Cox, Cable, the, the, the known ISPs for North America. 
And their concept of a network is a single box, which sits at the very front of the network in the position here that we would call modem. And um, I think it's important for us to agree that that is not a network and that the ISP is not, we certainly don't want to present them here as the enemy <laughs> because that's not accurate, but they're not helping. Um, they, their goals are uh, slightly different than our own, um, but they control the front of the network. And, and for us to get everything that we want out of a network for our customers, we have to have a network that looks more like this and less like a modem that sits in a room uh, as the single device. And so that's why we have to come to this minimum standard agreement. We have to agree that when we say network, this is what we're talking about. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more as we go. And the reason we have to come to that agreement is this is what we want on the network. Um, you'll notice right at the top uh, is your business model right there. Uh, but also uh, there's almost no reason to build an advanced network for your client customer uh, without them being able to support all of the things pictured here. Uh, and that is kind of, that creates a bit of a conflict because any one of these things can be supported by a very basic network that would be essentially what the ISP would provide, which is a, a an all-in-one box in the middle of the room. So you could do any one of these six things with their solution, but we ultimately want to be the provider of all of this. And I say that quite seriously because we, the, our, the biggest area for growth in virtually every aspect of customer interface regard, is, is networking. And so if you're the first person to encounter the client, the end user customer, you can be the network provider for them. And that would allow them to, of course, uh, create a, an extremely advanced security system. Uh, and then all of the other accessories that go with that and the automation that goes with that. So, so we have to kind of agree that this is a network, <laughs> the minimum standard agreement. And then we have to agree that this is really the goal. Um, and now, for the purpose of this presentation, there every client will be different and there will be different goals and we will discuss that as well. Um, the other thing we need to do when we talk about building a foundation is we need to classify. And the reason we want to classify is because it it's the easiest way for us to communicate the most efficiently about where we are uh, on the whole networking um, platform. So if a bunch of, now we're going to talk about, first we spoke about what physicists have to agree on. They have their standard model. We have our uh, minimum standard agreement on a network. Uh, and when biologists get together, <laughs> they have they have to agree on a classification system and they use a language. And so when they say a word uh, about a classification, everybody knows what group of animals they're talking about. Because otherwise, they would have to describe the animal in detail instead of just say corvidae, which means um, uh, crows, magpies, and um, jays. So when they say that word, everybody knows what they mean. And so with this slide, I'm telling you, we're gonna talk about consumer grade. That's a classification of product and it's real, uh, professional grade and enterprise grade. And why we need to, as, as industry professionals, why we need to understand deeply what each one of these things mean because you can deploy being a snap one dealer you have access to all of these you have you can build a complete consumer network you can build a complete professional grade network and a complete enterprise grade network and if you don't understand the differences between those things it can get super confusing so we got to move to the next slide which would be what is consumer grade and i always like to make sure that um, when a networking expert is training on networking, you, the, the, the temptation, I'm gonna go back, the temptation is to make this into a good, better, best type of presentation, consumer grade, good, professional grade, better, enterprise grade, best. That, that is not the intention here. Um, 
it, it may be true in certain scenarios, and I can certainly present scenarios where it is a good, better, best relationship between these three classifications, but that's not the point of this slide. And you have to be really wary of a networking manager or trainer that speaks poorly of consumer gear, because consumer gear, it is very difficult to design and engineer consumer grade networking hardware because you have a price point that you have to hit. You have to understand what features to add and subtract. I mean, it is extremely difficult to make consumer grade networking gear because it, I would argue it's easier to make enterprise grade because you can literally take all of the best components regardless of price and just create your switch or your router, right? You cannot do that in consumer grade. There are other limitations. and. So we have to be gentle when we discuss consumer grade because it 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 has its application. It's also a business model, and we need to understand that model. And the model is direct to consumer, which means it skips over us, all of us. Ideally, if we were to talk as truthfully as possible about consumer grade networking hardware manufacturers, they do not want us in the middle. They want to sell directly to the consumer. Now, many of us <laughs> insert ourselves in the middle and install, and if I were to name consumer grade products, I would be say something like Eero or Orbi. And you would say, yeah, we, we do that. We use that product per application. But ideally, that manufacturer wants to sell directly to the consumer. Um, and that's how the relationship is built. So we have to understand we're not part of that relationship. And when we insert ourselves into the middle of that, we need to understand more, more deeply what that means. Um, when we look at consumer gear, the next step thing we need, we become very clear is that it is DIY. They are directly telling the consumer how to purchase it, uh, fill out the, the um, you know, registration and support, card and then you know qr code the warranty and then uh here's how you install it again they're they're actively skipping over us uh limited options and settings of course this doesn't mean bad but they have to understand what not to put in the product and how to limit the product uh so that it gets deployed as quickly as possible and this limited settings creates a limited scope and a limited capability and that's where the other two categories of networking gear come in. When you expand beyond the scope of consumer gear, you need to understand where that hard stop is and when to switch over to professional gear. And when from that point, there's kind of a, a hybridization between professional grade and enterprise grade, and then there's kind of the full enterprise grade. So it's a spectrum of application. And so, this uh, limited scope and capability, as long as you and your field technicians understand the limitations, um, then you can apply it correctly where it needs to be applied. Um, optimized for speed test. You may say, what a strange bullet point to drop at the bottom of, of consumer grade networking hardware. It's like, well, that's what they do. Um, when you buy the Wi-Fi 6 chiplets or any of the consumer grade uh, chip functions, they streamline them uh, for functionality. They reduce quite a bit of the feature sets. And when they do this, they focus on typically one thing, speed. And that is because that's the only thing that the consumer understands that is a measurable. If I were to speak to an end user consumer about what makes a great network, and I, I could simply use speed and they would understand that. This one's faster than that one, therefore it's better. And, and that's not even remotely accurate. But the consumer grade manufacturers know this intimately. If I make something blindingly fast, you will ignore all of its other limitations. And, and by the way, that has come true. Um, you can crash in our labs, we can crash consumer grade networking hardware instantaneously. We can make it stop working um, because we know how to do that. Um, but it 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 is optimized to be fast. So don't be fooled by the speed. That's that's a consumer gimmick. And it's super helpful for them to sell their product. And their goals 
can be different than ours. And so when I go on to the professional grade networking gear, you're like, okay, you've got me. Everything you said about consumer grade networks was mildly interesting. <laughs> I'm on to the next point. What, what, could, what could this possibly be? Well, professional grade networking is a business to business strategy. And that means our company as the manufacturer we market directly to your company and we specifically provide you the warranty. We don't warranty your end user customer. We don't care about that. We warranty to you. And that's a dramatically different application for a business model. We also specifically want to train people, um, your technicians to garner higher levels of expertise. And so when we do that, we're creating an environment where we're modeling a product for you specifically that you can then present to the client. And this, uh, this actually is more complicated than that sounds. Those two bullet points is like, oh, that's super easy. What a great idea. Yeah, there's one problem with this strategy is the consumer doesn't know the name of your brand, right? Every consumer will know Eero. Right. I mean, it's, you know, owned by Amazon. How are they not going to know that product? It's everywhere. Um, but they're not going to know Arachnus because it, this business model, as, as strong as it, as it is and as well as it works um, to create ex excellent networks, um, it, its limitation is uh, notoriety uh, because we create our own uh, bubble, if you will, in which we function in. And then there is... But because we have our own bubble, the communication is quite high. So we can communicate with your field technicians and your engineers to create product that's ever expanding and ever growing in its functionality. Completely the opposite of what consumer grade is doing. They're actively looking for features to remove, right? Because they're trying to streamline the deployment of their products. We're actively looking to see how we can maximize feature sets that improve performance, but they increase complexity. And when you increase complexity, you have to be training people who are experts in this field and not random citizens. So this leads to deeper feature sets, uh, that have more, far more customization and far more application or scope, so job size. And then the the final piece of this puzzle is that, um, and Evan will go into this in some detail, um, is that there's a a management platform for uh, these professional grade products, and this management platform has you in mind. It's not the consumer. Now, there's a consumer interface with this management platform, but it's really secretly designed for your field technicians to maximize the performance of every network. And when you do that, the dream uh, comes true. And the dream is that a slide where I showed you where all of the things can successfully sit on a high functioning network. You can have an advanced security system, an advanced control system, lights, shades, 4K streaming video, all of it, you know, distributed audio. You're capable of supporting an entire modern home or business infrastructure with a network that's designed properly in the professional grade scenario. And it's very difficult to do that with consumer grade stuff without having all bunch, just an array of problems. And so the next step would be, okay, again, <laughs> mildly interesting. <laughs> What else you got for me? Um, so enterprise grade is this uh, third tier. And it, um, it you, after I just described to you what professional grade was, you're like, why in the world would I ever need enterprise grade? You know, in, in the, on the enterprise side, and I work in entirely in the enterprise world. My entire daily focus is on enterprise grade networks. It's, it's all that I talk about and all that I do. And so I, I'm extremely positive about their application and their scope. Um, but uh, you have to keep in mind um, the bigger picture, or certainly I do. This is me talking to myself here. I have to keep in mind the bigger picture of where their, where their application uh, runs into the consumer world. 
right? We all understand that if I'm doing building a data center for AT&T, we're going to use enterprise grade hardware for that, right? Of course, um, because of the standards, uh, enterprise grade hardware uh, has to meet a group of standards that are uh, extremely complicated. Uh, and so I'm going to simplify them and kind of break them down into a couple bullet points. So the first standard is a higher security protocol. And this is on the firewall or the front of the network. Um, so inbound, outbound traffic is uh, managed at a much higher um, scrutiny. Uh, things at the enterprise level, you have to be able to deploy a firewall that is suitable for a financial institution or a hospital and or a military institution. And so these that level um, is required to reach the enterprise uh, grade uh, platform. Uh, so in general, higher security standards on the infrastructure of the network. Secondly, it would be Enterprise grade stuff is built to a 10 times more robust manufacturing uh, procedure. So what that means in reality, that sounds obscene. You're like, that can't be true. Um, how could you build something 10 times more reliable? Well, because the FCC regulates enterprise facilities. And so <laughs> when a when a carrier uh, uh AT&T would be an example of a carrier or, or Verizon wants to build a head end or hub facility. Um, they are, the rules are, they have to, their minimum standard of performance and reliability is 99.9% .9 uptime minimum standard as per the FCC. So, so they have very specific manufacturing rules. And so just so you know, um, we sell enterprise grade stuff at snap one we we and it is will be branded the with the access networks logo so so we're the enterprise grade manufacturer here on this side and so so at snap one you can get the entire spectrum of um, enterprise hardware from consumer grade all the way to enterprise grade so there's a reason why i want to take you through this and have you kind of more deeply understand these classifications because they do matter and they affect the price if you could imagine building a product that has a 10 times higher uh, lifespan uh, in the manufacturing process, you're going to get uh, the, the cost of that product is going to go up dramatically. The other thing that the enterprise world does that is really poorly understood is the specifications have to be accurate. Now, that may sound like, yeah, great. Um, what's so important about that? Well, in the consumer world, again, never trust a networking guy that speaks poorly of consumer product. But in, <laughs> as I proceed to tell you something about consumer hardware that you need to be aware of, they don't have to tell you the truth. That's a huge advantage for consumer uh, networking hardware. They can say things that are fundamentally not true um, and present that literally as an advertisement. And you have to, I suppose you'd have to sue them to get them to stop. But, but an example, I just saw literally this morning, an advertisement uh, for three Wi-Fi modules that are advertised to cover 10,000 square feet of residential deployment. Now, that's impossible. That's physically impossible. Like, the physics of that is impossible. So, yet they can say that, just generally speaking. And so, and quite literally advertise to that. Um, and so, we cannot, on the enterprise side, because our specifications are used for design implementation. So the specs that we publish have to be accurate because the municipalities and uh, the carriers that use it uh, design to that spec, right? And if you design three Wi-Fi modules to cover 10,000 square feet as your spec, you're gonna have a really bad uh, experience. And nobody even takes that seriously. Nobody in our world sees that and is, stunned by that information because they know it's not true. But in our world, we, we live and die by the accuracy of the specifications. And um, it's all physics-based performance. So it's all measurable. There's no claim that can be made uh, that cannot be measured. 
And so that's a big, <laughs> you may go, so what, why, why does that matter? Well, because of the reasons I previously spoke in the consumer world, there's outlandish claims can be made and nobody can measure any of those claims that are made. There's no tool to measure the absurdity of which they can get away with saying. Doesn't mean the gear's not good, just means that's not true. There's a big difference. Both things can be true simultaneously. The gear can be great for its price point, but it's still not true based on the information on the piece of paper. So we can't do that. All of our measurements have to be accurate and repeatable. Uh, and I say no hyperbole, meaning we can't exaggerate performance uh, to make our product look better. It, it, it has to be just the facts. And adaptable, expandable, and capable is really the mantra of enterprise grade work. Um, it's all uh, has to connect together and work together. You can mix and match hardware at the enterprise level um, because ISPs, and carriers and financial institutions that use this enterprise grade hardware, they cannot be held hostage by one piece of gear if it's out of stock. They, you know, if the Barracuda uh, firewall is out of stock, they can buy the Sophos firewall. If the Cisco switch is out of stock, they can buy the Extreme Network switch. And they and the specs have to be accurate and functional. And it's a plug and play as long as you understand the programming language of the gear. Um, and so as we move on, um, so let me check my time. All right, well, we're right, we're right down to the, we're right there. Couple, a couple more minutes. Um, so, so now that we have kind of those uh, fundamental rules in place, we can talk about how you might build a network if you understood those rules and how it might change uh, your, your networking behavior. Because remember, um, the, uh, the networking, category is among the fastest growing categories in uh, home automation slash smart home, um, which includes security, right? Um, you guys are a huge part of the modern smart home and um, the networking infrastructure is one of the fastest growing segments because some of these large smart homes require extremely advanced networks. Oh, like networks like homes have never had before. And that's the mind frame you need to be in. And this modem that I have circled in red here to show you again, our minimum standard agreement on what a network is, uh, you can see that we have the internet as represented by the planet earth. Um, and uh, the internet is just any computer that's not in your local network, right? So if it's not in your local group of, um, it's not in your house, if, it's, if it has to go through this modem device, that would be the internet. And one of the things, and I checked this this morning just because I wanted to be sure, again, 84%, 84 point something. So very nearly 85% of Americans receive their internet service, 85% of Americans receive their internet service through a cable modem. And a cable modem is an analog to digital converter. It's a mod demod. What modem means is modulate, demodulate, mod modem. There should be two Ds, really, if you were really to this used to be an old joke when I worked in this that industry a long time ago. Um, modem is really spelled with two Ds. Uh, so for efficiency's sake, we've removed one, but it is mod demod. So it, it modulates from the analog hybrid fiber infrastructure of the cable companies to packet language inside the network. So your network is completely digital and, and communicates in packets. The outside world beyond that modem can frequently be analog and it speaks in a language called QAM. Uh, and, we'll, and we do trainings on this. And every one of these slides, we do virtually a full training on if you're interested in that. So the depth that we can go is, is it's quite, deep, but we're just cruising through right now. And so the modem is the gateway piece, if you will, to the outside world, and it's provided by a third party. And then we would ideally provide um, the rest of the network. And one of the things that the cable companies did, and I need to spend one minute on this. So, so ISPs, Verizon, you know, Comcast, uh, they're publicly held companies and they have, um, they have um, these meetings at the end of the year where they uh, tell their, uh, they have kind of an earnings report, which I find fascinating. And I watched theirs, which you might put you to sleep, but 
if you're not sleeping through the earnings report, one of the things that cable companies get quite a bit of pressure from Wall Street on is they're, they're losing subscribers to cable type TV services. Um, but their, their growth avenue is through internet provision. So their ability to provide high-speed internet is their area of growth, whereas their subscribers, so it's this, they've got this internet going up and TV subscribers going down, and that makes their stock very flat because they're actively losing subscribers and actively gaining subscribers to a net net of effectively zero, and Wall Street's not big on that, on zero. Um, but one of the things they presented this past uh, earnings report was a couple of weeks ago was they said that they are going to introduce multi-gig service. So you see this multi-gig up here. So multi-gig service is how they're going to keep, they're going to take their existing subscriber base that they provide internet for and charge them twice as much. So they're going to go, instead of $99, they're going to average out at $199 for multi-gig service. Now, why does this matter to us? Because those are our customers also. And if our customer is about to purchase something that they cannot consume, right? You can buy this pie at the grocery store. And the reason you can buy it at the grocery store is because you have utensils at home that allow you to eat it, right? Well, the cable company is in the business of selling people a service that they cannot consume. There is no way your average consumer can subscribe to multi-gig service and consume that service. I, I hope, are we making eye contact here? Like they're about to be sold, their business model is to sell a consumer something that the consumer cannot consume. So our job is to explain it. We have to be the bad guy and explain to that consumer, oh, I, you're subscribing to multi-gig service? I, I'm looking around your house. I don't see any <laughs> two and a half gig n base T connectors on anything. Right, so the customer's about to subscribe to two gig service and there's not a single two gig n base T ethernet connection in the house. So how are they gonna, and this is the growth model for the ISPs is to sell them this service. So they're going to be effective and sell it. So we, our job is to say, hey, I, because you can't consume what you're about to buy, I will explain to you that you cannot consume it. And then I will show you how to consume it. I can present to you the product that will allow you to consume it. And let's keep in mind, one of the things we need to understand is that consumer, they love their internet and they think speed really matters. And we don't, we're not trying to talk them out of that, even though it's slightly untrue. Um, what we're trying to do is, is take their enthusiasm for speed and show them that we can maximize that, right? Very different. We're not trying to say, oh no, you don't actually need two gig service. You have no way of, no, we're gonna like, if you want it, I can make it happen for you. So those are two different messages. Not if you want it, I don't understand why you want it, you don't need it. Eh, no, no, I see that you want this, Get the cable company's done a great job of providing a need and a want for it. Now I can help you actually use it uh, and actually consume it. And so you would require a two and a half gig router to do that at the front of the network. That's kind of an important step. And so that's really um, the first step of the network is to make sure that uh, we can provide uh, the speeds that the ISP is um uh, sending to that modem device at the front of the network. Now I say this is perfect for one gig networks. That's for my own personal, um, the note for me, because you're like, why would I put a two and a half gig router in a one gig network? You would because most consumers think they need more than one gig speed. The consumers that want two gig think they need faster speed because they've actually don't have a high performing network. Most consumers, if they had a high performing one gig network, have zero interest in a two gig network. Once you experience a properly designed and deployed one gig network, you, you have no, you, there's no need for more speed. Um, I mean, seriously. Uh, however, because they haven't, they want faster because that must fix the problem. That's the headspace. And so, a two and a half gig router is perfect for a fully laid out one gig network because it is no longer the bottleneck uh, between the, the modem and the router. That relationship is one to one. And as fast as that goes coming in, you can go out. And whether you attach it to a one gig switch or not, it may be irrelevant. Um, 
but it's important to understand a properly functioning one gig network is can be really impressive. Um, and the next piece in the modem or in the network in our standard agreement, as you see circled here in pink, is the switch. And when we get to the switch part, this is um, an important element because we're now trying to provide uh, two and a half gig service to all of the possible hardwired uh, things in this network. And the reason we need to hardwire once we go over one gig is we need to, the uh, virtually the only way you can exceed one gig in performance is wired. It's very hard, it's very difficult to reach speeds in Wi-Fi above one gig. And so you need the ability uh, to have ports available for the devices that are faster than one gig for them to be hardwired right into the network. So a multi-gig switch, which of course we have, um, would be exactly what you would use in that application. And here's your two and a half gig switch um, with all the cool features it comes with uh, oversee built right into it. All, all these things are fantastic products that I'm showing you here. I, I'm trying to present um, how we would uh, uh, kind of attack in a sales way um, the the fact that the ISPs are going to double down on speeds and then we're going to let be left behind. Um, and so here are here are your solutions. And the next the the kind of final piece to the puzzle would be your wireless part of your network. And we would have in this application we would go beyond um, professional grade right up to an enterprise grade uh, uh, access point. Uh, for wireless deployment because we need this two and a half gig connection here um, so that we can uh, literally hit the the access point with a full with the full subscription speed that the client now the client's going to have a very difficult time getting their iPhone to connect or their tablet to connect faster than one gig, but it will go right up to one gig and hit the one gig cap uh, on their uh, Wi-Fi card. Uh, if their card does go up to two and a half gig, they have a chance if they're close enough and there's not, not enough interference, it, it's a nice clean deployment. Uh, they can they can exceed uh, one gig throughput. Um, but but the first step is is the access point has to be hardwired back to the switch and it has to be a two and a half gig switch and a two and a half gig router to get that customer to that point. And that's really um, the end of this part of the presentation. Um, and we're just, I'm just about right on time here. Um, and so you're saying to yourself, gee, Andrew, what's all that cost? Um, why would I do that? It seems so expensive, $10,000. But you have to keep in mind the ISPs, the, the instigator of this <laughs> problem uh, literally said in their earnings report, we want to average what we're going to go into neighborhoods that have above $250,000 uh, per front door annual income. And we're looking to charge them about $300 a month. So you say to yourself, they want to average $300,000 or uh, they want to average um, $300 a month in neighborhoods that are over a quarter, quarter million dollars income per front door. Um, these are high end neighborhoods. And um, that three hundred dollars a month is uh, thirty. That's the thirty five hundred dollars a year. So, so the client that subscribes to this multi gig network is potentially going to spend three thousand five hundred dollars a year for their for their for something they can't consume. So, how would a ten thousand dollar network be out of the question? They're going to presumably, when you ask them how long, when the ISPs ask end users how long are they going to subscribe to the internet. They have a very clever way of doing that because they don't want the consumer to think about it until the end of time, like, oh, for the rest of my life. So they ask them, how much do you like your internet service? They're like, oh, I love my internet service. Right. So that they, they're they very clever about not making it seem like a lifetime. Over a lifetime, you're going to spend $175,000 on internet subscription speeds. So don't tell me $10,000 when we present this information to our end user clients, buying an expensive network that allows them to consume what they're paying for, to actually take in what they're what they're expending their money on, is we're doing them a favor at ten thousand dollars. We we that's actually me, you know, budgeting this down. You can build a one gig network for 
you know, $3,000. And most of them have not experienced a properly designed, fully flushed out one gig design, but they're going to jump right to two gig. We're going to help them understand that. And, and we understand the principles of networking that the, how we can take them through the consumer grade, professional grade and enterprise grade story. And then how we can um, uh, explain to them that a network is necessary because there's this kind of minimum agreement that we have to have on how we get to the place where we can consume the product that they're purchasing. No one else is going to tell them this. No one else is going to explain to them that that box that the cable company sold you will not provide for you what you think you're getting. Just walk into the other room and tell me how fast it is. Right. So, now, we're about to hand over to, to Evan here, and I just wanted to let you guys know that at Access Networks, uh, as a part of the Snap-on group of companies, we do network design services, configuration services, programming services. Uh, we can design uh, full enterprise-grade networks, the whole deal. Um, we can do hybrid mixtures of professional grade and enterprise grade. Um, and we do trainings on every aspect of networking. And, and I mean every aspect of networking. We want our customer, our dealer customers, our integrated partners to understand networking deeply so they can grow that bucket of their business. Uh, and if this sounds like something that you might be interested in, we're here for you. It's what we do. Um, and the uh, benefits of, uh, uh, of oversee which is the part of the professional grade platform that I think is the single most important thing to understand. Uh, we're going to hand over to Evan and then I'm going to, uh, he's going to tell me when to change slides. So I'm going to still be behind here changing slides and Evan's going to take over the presentation. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Andrew. <clears throat> All right. I will. Uh, so as, as Andrew mentioned, uh, uh, Oversee is our remote management platform. Really the idea. So, so a little bit of background, I'll, I'll, Give you guys a little backstory. Overseas started uh, just about ten years ago. I think it'll be ten years in April, um, and we started it out as as really a platform to uh, allow for remote rebooting of our lot boxes, which is our IP controllable outlet uh, PDUs. Um, since that time, over the ten years, we have grown significantly in in our capability as well as our our adoption or application throughout uh, multiple different channels, in, including the security channel. Um, so what I figured I'd do today is, is kind of give you guys an overview of what Oversee is today, because um, I know there's not a lot of uh, a lot of adoption in here. So I'll just I'm just going to present a high level overview of it. So effectively, Oversee, like I said, is an Oversee is a is a remote management platform. I think where I, where we position it today is really an operationally essential software that allows you guys to to interact with a a project um, really through uh, through the setup and the support of the system. Um, really allowing you to do troubleshooting, remote troubleshooting, understand the connectivity of devices as they're installed in the house, and ideally preventing truck rolls and eliminating truck rolls, allowing you to sell to to solve problems, uh, shorten downtime when there are issues, or even be armed with information and tools by the time you arrive at the job site. So that's really Oversee as a platform. Oversee, we have Oversee enabled devices, which is kind of the first class of products. And, and that is that lives in our Arachnus switches, access points. Um, it will, it, it's uh, Luma cameras, um, binary video switchers, episode uh, amplifiers. So all of the products that Snap One makes, um, typically in all of our brands that have any network connectivity, you're going to find, find an Oversee enablement uh, in, inside those devices. So when I look at, say, just an Arachnus access point, for example, or an Arachnus switch, um, like the two and a half gig one that Andrew was talking about, that, that device is oversee enabled, meaning when you connect that thing to the network, it calls home to our server. Using the oversee platform, you're allowed, you're able to monitor its status. Is it connected? Is it disconnected? Perform troubleshooting actions like rebooting PoE ports, rebooting the device, you know, controlling power on at PoE ports, upgrading firmware. Um, looking at activity logs, things like that, all of that remotely without having to open up any ports on the firewall or any 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 kind of VPN capability, all of that, those devices just call home. Um, so that's really an Oversee enabled device. The next class, so with, with that class of product and really with all flavors of Oversee, we have an end customer facing application called Oversee Connect. The idea there is to, is to allow your customers, the end customer, the ability to self-service, to self-resolve issues. So if, 
if an Apple TV or a, or a, a POE camera or something like that is locked, locked up, we allow you, the, the integrator, the ability to create macros to allow them to properly reboot devices or affect devices without having to get behind racks and unplug things and, and monkey with wires that inevitably they will knock loose and, and, and do more damage than good. Uh, so that's really the Oversea Connect thing. There's a few other there's a few other components in the, inside of there. There's parental controls. There are wireless Mac uh, blacklisting for for say when you have, have children that have mobile devices, you can schedule times where that mobile device won't connect uh, to the system. So really, depending on the hardware that you have inside the inside the network or in, in the installation, um, really delivers a different set of sub feature of, of features. So really, what you need to do is just evaluate what we do um, or what you have with the products in order to determine what you can do. But it's a pretty a pretty impressive um, uh, tool set that you can extend to your end customer. We've had really great reviews around it. Um, going up to the next level is the Oversea Pro Agent. So imagine taking the Watt box or the, the switch or the access point or the camera that I was talking about that talks directly to a server. Now the Oversea Pro Agent allows you to monitor any IP connected device within the net, within the system. So that includes security devices, any anything with an IP address, anything that's that's on the network, we're going to be able to monitor and provide you status to that device. The Oversea Pro agent comes embedded on really three different classes of products. So our Arachnus router, so that 520 or 220 router that, that Andrew was just talking about, um, we've got, uh, we've got control core controllers. So if anybody's a control four dealer, it comes embedded on the, on the controllers, uh, as well as we have a purpose built standalone oversee hub. So in the, in the cases where you have say a consumer grade install, but you still want the, the capability to monitor the network, dropping a hub in those type of, of installations still allows you operational efficiency and consistency in, in troubleshooting without the need to, to add additional hardware. So, um, so that, that hub is the one thing that you can, that you can use there. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. So this slide is just a quick overview of what an Oversea enabled device, which is the left-hand column looks like versus what an Oversea Pro agent or Pro location looks like. You can see you've got some, some basic functionality of, of resetting devices, firmware updates, configuration of devices. But once you get to the, to, extending this to devices that are not Oversea enabled. Now we can start to do things like speed test, add additional tool sets like ping tests and trace routes, monitoring of, again, any device on the network, notification. So when a device disconnects or reconnects to the network, we can do a push notification through a mobile application, or we can send you an email, however you want to do that. Um, and then again, we have with the third, with the Oversea Pro, we have third-party integrations. So things like SNMP, or Onvif for, secu for security cameras, um, and then a bunch of, of individual integrations that we've developed that are for commonly used devices within the system, things like televisions from Samsung or Sony, AVRs, um, audio video receivers, um, amplifiers. There's, there's a, a bevy of devices that we have for custom integrations for devices that are commonly used. So that's really what the Pro Agent delivers us uh, above and beyond what the Oversea Enable device is. So go ahead and jump to the next slide. This is just a quick overview of, of uh, the, the screenshots. So the one in the middle here is the location dashboard. What we found is, is really in, in smaller companies, there's a lack of a CRM device. So what we're offering is a little bit of light CRM here where you have customer contact information. If you need somebody to get access, get directions to the house, uh, it's not you know over the river and through the woods. You can actually just click on the address. It opens up a Google Maps page and you're driving with directions. Um, you've got some speed test results. You've got latency measurements for the for the network. All of those things are available with the Pro Agent. Um, it allows you to kind of get some some performance metrics on the system. We're not necessarily looking for um, for for exact numbers, but we you know we so we do give you some some health like good, better, best kind of performance. So green is obviously good. The biggest thing here is consistency. So if there's a change in latency or you know, a sustained change in latency or a sustained change in speed test, that's when you start looking at into if there's a problem. The Wayne and land latency allows you to divide and conquer. Are we looking upstream uh, by something from the ISP or is it something inside the house? So if the WAN latency skyrockets and land latency stays accurate, 
odds are you're chasing the ISP side or from the router out. If you're looking, if it's inside the network, the LAN latency skyrockets and, and WAN latency stays stuck, then you're looking inside the network. So we kind of give you a, that, that first step of troubleshooting of divide and conquer uh, or divide, you know, split in half every time. So that's really our first step of troubleshooting there. Um, the, the image on the right on the left there is, is what our mobile app looks like in dark mode. And then the image on the left is just a quick screenshot of Oversee Connect. So go ahead, next slide. This is a, an overview of the device list page. So this is just an example of a location where you can see green check marks means the device is healthy and connected and, and discoverable on the network. Device name is a friendly name. We give you the ability to put the thing into in, rooms, IPs, Macs, manufacturer, model. And then we give you some troubleshooting uh, capabilities right from the screenshot. So rebooting the device, if we have that capability with the device, and then even performing firmware updates with a single click from the device list. Go to the next screen. This is a device details overview. So this is a watt box. Uh, in here, you can see that we have 12 outlets. You've got individual uh, current draw by, um, by outlet. You've got the overall current draw, the incoming voltage. Uh, you've got a, a, just a ton of information so you can see from a power perspective. And this is pretty indicative of, of other products. So as you get into our switches, you've got a very similar interface. Um, but from here, you can turn outlets on, turn outlets off. One item of note here is those the outlets 9, 11, and 12, uh, and 5 that have the disabled, the power button disabled. Um, what that is, is that's a that's a kind of a safety mechanism that we've allowed, that we've built in to say, hey, look, this is a network attached device. If I was to turn that thing off, I'm going to sever my ability to communicate to the network. So, for example, that Cisco SG300 switch or a package RK1 router or the Aris modem. If I turn off the outlet that's powering the Aris modem, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm getting in my car and driving. So what we do inside of Oversee is we allow you to identify a specific outlet as a network attached device. So it eliminates the ability to turn it off and you can only power cycle it at that point. So that's just a quick outlet or, or overview of the device list. Let's jump to the next page. This is Wi-Fi management. One of the great things that we get with Oversee and really cloud-based configuration is, 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 a different, is it the ability to live at a different level. If I had 10 access points in a, in a location, I'd effectively typically have to go with 10 individual local interfaces and configure all of those devices. What we're doing with Wi-Fi management is we're saying, hey, we're going to bring everything for your that makes up your Wi-Fi system, and we're going to present it to you in a single screen. So the top part that's currently empty because this is a demo system, you would see all your wirelessly connected devices. You would see their signal strength. You would see which access point they were connected to, what SSID they're attached to, and then their data consumption in TX and RX. Below that is any SSID profiles that have been created. So you can see which ones are which. Um, you can edit them, pass phrases, encryption type, uh, enabling or disabling DFS, for example. Um, you know, just a bunch of different traffic uh, um, uh, profile settings on how you want the Wi-Fi devices to connect. Once you create a profile, the bottom part of that page is which access points you have in your system. So if you have one or 100, it doesn't really matter. You choose which ones get which SSID. The second you hit apply, whether you have one or 100, they're all going to get that updated change. So you can literally, you can, you can apply settings to 10 APs as fast as you can to one. Um, so that's really the idea of being able to this set once apply to many concept that we have at the at the platform level rather than at the device level. So it's something that we see a ton of efficiency in saving you guys' time, and it creates a bunch of consistency uh, where human error as you bounce through multiple APs, human error becomes higher. So let's go jump onto the next screen. All right, last one. This is uh, this is a 3P integration. So this is a Discover device. So obviously we don't make Vizio TVs, um, but they use the Google protocol. Um, and so because of that, I'm just showing you some additional details that we get uh, to just kind of help you out, either identifying the device or evaluate firmware. So if you have to call the manufacturer, you get some of that information in there. So really that's the third party integrations with the time that we have. Let's go ahead and jump to the next screen. Um, let's jump to the next screen just for the interest of time. That's really where we are today. I want to thank Andrew for the immense amount of information that he, he gave us today. Um, obviously, 
this is me, the other guy. If you guys have any problems or questions, please feel free to reach out to us directly. You've got our contact information on here. Uh, we're more than happy to answer questions. Uh, and then the last thing that we'll do is jump to the next slide is talk about the promotion that uh, was talked to Hannah talked about at the start of this is if you're a new partner, we're going to go ahead and extend a $500 uh, discount off of your first purchase through Snap One by using this promo code. And if you're an existing partner, we'll give you 10% off of Arachnus or Access Networks products um, by using that same uh, promo code. So with that, I'll toss it back to Hannah to answer any questions uh, that, that you guys have. Awesome. All right. Let me just pull up the questions over here. Okay. So here's one that came through. Is there a paid tier of Oversee that unlocks additional features that are not available with the free version? Yeah. So currently the the all it, there's a Oversee is free for all users, regardless of the type. I think we talked about the Oversee enabled devices versus the pro agent, but today everything is is free. Uh, in general, when we're looking at this, we are having, as, as Oversee continues to grow and gets further adoption and, and our integrators are more, our partners are more and more leveraging it, they're asking for, for more complex features that will, that do cost us money to develop and support. So we are evaluating a paid tier, but we will always see a free tier being available um, for everybody and really not taking away any of the features that are part of the platform today. This is really just an optional tier that would go above and beyond what what the offering is for, for really just general operation. Excellent. Okay. And then I see we have another question over here that I have pulled up. When will Access Network APs be native and oversee? Uh, the goal is uh, the end of Q2. So this year, and I guess the end of Q2, is that June? Um, and and we, it works now, but it there's refining it and we don't want it to be uh, glitchy. It need, Oversee is a very cool platform and we want to honor it properly. So there, right now we're in the final stages of getting the details right as to what's going to unfold uh, natively in, in there when it deploys. Excellent. Okay. And then I have another question here. Um, Snap One has two networking brands. Is it okay to use products from both brands on the same product, a uh, project, sorry, or do you have to stick to one or the other? Uh, you want me to take this one, Evan? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so at Access Networks, we would say absolutely. We, we mixing and matching hybridization of networks uh, is really part of the more you learn about networking, the more you can pinpoint where you'll need an enterprise piece and where you'll need a professional grade piece or or even where you need a consumer product because there are times when consumer products are the correct answer for the job. It, I mean, as much as it breaks my heart, right? I mean, <laughs> but it's true. And so, so yeah, the deeper the, of your understanding, the more we train you, the more you get involved in networking, you'll understand hybrid as a, the hybrid effect uh, more completely. And I think it's going to get closer and closer because as uh, Oversea grows, that hybrid uh, hybridization will be very smooth and uh, the mixing and matching will be very simple and, yeah. and, and entirely application-based. Yeah, I think the the only caveat that I would throw on on top of what Andrew said is the really the only limitation I would say is with with Wi-Fi, um, do not mix and match across even product families within the same brand, at least from an arachnus. Like don't don't miss mix a an X20 class with an X10 or but I think Ruckus or I'm sorry, the Access Networks side of products um are are far more resilient to cross family. Um, hybridization, is that correct? Uh, no, that's incorrect. Okay. So um, we can use different network switches. However, we do use a Wi-Fi controller or wireless controller for our Wi-Fi access points. So we cannot have co-population between the two brands that are offered by Snap1. So it's one or the other for oh. Wi-Fi. However, yes with the hardware switches, as well as the firewalls between the two families, thumbs up. Uh, yeah, I think I think Evan was explaining that we, if using it in, uh, on Arachnus, he would want the 20 series to stick with the 20 series. 
Um, yeah. Whereas with access networks, as long as it's an entirely access networks Wi-Fi application or or deployment, you can mix and match in there yes. a little more easily. Um, what it was what it sounded like you were explaining. That's that's exactly what I was trying to point out. Is yeah. is is with the access networks product, stay yeah you know as long as you stay within access networks uh, APs, you're great. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so I see one that says, uh, do these switches uh, slash snap one slash Arachnus provide SFP plus 10 gig ports? <laughs> yeah, you want that one? <laughs> oh, uh, there is. So so um, the I know 10 gig is becoming very popular. Um, there's a five gig switch uh, that's available right now. And then there's a future uh, future 10 gig products on the roadmap. Um, but uh, 10 gig application is really uh, server farm slash carrier grade speed. But um, and we can certainly design to 10 gig uh, as a company. But uh, 10 gig, the I believe the max right now is five gig switch. Is that correct, uh, Evan? No, actually, the, so the the Arachnus 920 switch is is a 10 gig per port, uh, 100 gig backplane um, speeds on that on that thing. Oh, so there you go. It's Wrong a monster. Yeah. yeah, so there's a 10 gig switch. There's a, the 920 switch is a 10 gig switch. Yep. There's a 10 five there's gig. This. Oh, it's a five gig router. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Right. right. A lot of products. Awesome. Memorize. <laughs> yes, there is. Okay, so I think we're at about time, um, but someone was asking for a reminder of the promo code. I'm wondering maybe you can share oh, yeah. that one more time just so they can do that. And then uh, I think we should be good to, to give closing remarks. Awesome. All right, so it's right there. Um, anything else, Andrew or Evan, or are we good to close out today? I just want to thank everybody for their time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Have a good one, everyone.